Hello everyone. Hello. Welcome, Welcome to our AMC 8 live solve for problems 1 through 15. We're very excited to have you all here. Yes, hello everybody. Okay, real quick. I do this at the beginning of every live solve because I'm always curious. Where is everyone from? Like what state? Oh, there's so many responses in chat already. It seems like everyone's from all over the place. Yes, yes. And if you haven't noticed yet, the way you can type is you send a message to chat relay, and then you can send a message and it appears right here on screen. That's how we all interact with you. Minnesota. I'm from Minnesota. That's interesting. Okay. MO. Is it bad that I don't know what MO is? There, there's it's... only so many places it could be, right? Like Missouri, Montana. Montana. What is else? Montana. Uh, states are hard. <laughs> yeah, what states start with M? Missouri. Oh, yeah, I think it's Missouri. That is the least obvious MO state. That's so rude. Yeah. Wait, why? What MO? What is MI? Oh, is it Michigan? Yes. We're very oh, good yeah. at this. Oh, yeah, that's why we're doing the AMC 8 live solve, <laughs> not the geography V. This is great. And by the way, if you're curious, if people who are here, if you're curious what we're doing, usually it's a few, it takes a few minutes for everyone to pop in. And so right here at the beginning, we're just getting everyone used to the chat system. Massachusetts, Massachusetts represent. We're in the yeah, middle of a snowstorm. <laughs> Minnesota gang. Winnipeg. Winnipeg. That doesn't sound like a state. I think I know my geography well enough to recognize that. Is that the like place where Harry Potter lived, Winnipeg? That sounds like Canada to me. Um, oh, okay. That's so uh, cool. I have oh, a personal Rico. greeting. Elena, you are here. Who is this? We have international as well. Beijing, Hong Kong. Welcome, everyone. Amazing. And one thing I should also comment, if you're joining us on YouTube, because this should also be streaming live on YouTube, if you're joining us on YouTube, we unfortunately can't see all of your messages that are coming in. Uh, we're interacting with these first 300 people who came into the Zoom meeting. However, I think that there are lots of other people on the internet who can all see your comments. So you guys on the YouTube are probably having a very fun conversation right now. <laughs> Great. Shanghai, amazing. Yeah, yeah. And again, the way that this works, if you're inside the Zoom meeting, send your messages to chat relay, and then there'll be a way to participate. Because in this entire session, maybe I should start by saying what we do here. In this entire session, we're going to try to be interactive. Because what's the point of doing an AMC live solve if we can't all talk to each other? And so you'll see that we actually have the technology here to be able to draw, to be able to answer, to be able to put your ideas and bring them to life. Maybe let me just start by saying, do you know what the AMC is? There was this contest that just finished. I think there was an entire week that people could take this contest called the AMC 8. And was it hard? Was it easy? What did you guys think? This session, by the way, is designed for people. We we're going to try to be as welcoming as possible. This session is designed to be understandable. It's designed to be understandable. So we're going to try to go at a pace that as many people can understand as possible. If you happen to be super fast, don't get bored because we got to let everyone learn at, at, at some point as well too. And there will be some hard questions on the Thursday live solve as well. So these first 15 questions we're going to do as understandable as possible. But actually, I'm not going to do them myself. I'm joined by two incredible people that I want to introduce. So maybe I want to first introduce I, I'm just going to go in, in terms of the alphabetical order that we have uh, by last name here. We have Elena, Elena Baskakova. Elena, Elena, can you say hi or something so that your screen appears? Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. Right. Let me say a few things about Elena. Uh, Elena is actually a 2022 USA math, USA JMO winner and MOP attendee. The math Olympiad program called MOP is a, is a summer camp for about 60 extraordinary high school math students in the country. And so she was actually one of those as well. She also coaches the, her local middle school math team. And she was a member of Prime Circle 2022. Primes is a research program, uh, a program to introduce people to research run by MIT. So yes, they are our stars. That is Elena. I also want to introduce our other star, Aria. Aria, can you make a noise so that you appear? Yeah, hello, everyone. 
Yes, ARIA is also amazing. ARIA is an AV qualifier. As you know, if you do the AMCs and keep going onward, uh, AMC 10, AMC 12, go onward, you'll go on to the AIME, which is the second level of the math competition. And he was also the coach of his local middle school's math counts team. He actually did math counts when he was a student too from the state of Michigan. Uh, went very far actually i thought minnesota minnesota, minnesota I went very far. Yeah. all these m's are confusing me because we had a missouri and then we started playing the geography game as we were starting but he he also does other things too he enjoys listening to music and playing chess too so this is our team myself elena and aria and we're going to go ahead and solve these problems in case you didn't know yet we haven't looked at the problems in advance that's on purpose because we want to show you what it's like to think through a problem the first time you see it Sound good? And with that, let's bounce over. Let's maybe have Elena jump first. We'll just go in this alphabetical by last name order. So Elena, why don't you take it away with the first question? All right. So our first question is, what is the value of 8 times 4 plus 2 minus 8 plus 4 times 2? This one seems kind of tricky from the get-go because all of the numbers are the same and it's just the signs that are changing, which is a little bit scary if you're not careful, I guess. Probably the best way is just to approach this with order of operations and deal with each set of parentheses at a time. So we have multiplication first. This is 8 times 4, 32, plus 2. And then for the second bracket, ooh, okay, we have answers in chat already. This is so cool. 8 plus 4 times 2 is 8. And then again, we deal with each parentheses separately. So 32 plus 2 is 34, and then minus 8 plus 8 is 16. Lots of answers in chat saying 18, and I agree, 34 minus 16, we do the subtraction, and we get 18 as our answer. Um, yeah, okay. I think that was a pretty, I mean, somewhat straightforward problem. Uh, subtraction is always hard for me, I'm not going to lie. Um, subtraction is so hard. Arithmetic yeah. is the hardest math you can do. All right, so moving on to number two now. Oh, shapes. OK, a square piece of paper is folded twice into four equal quarters, as shown below, then cut along the dashed line when unfolded. The paper will match which of the following figures. OK, well, I guess my approach to this would be to like unfold it with the line in mind so like here let me move to the blank slide so we have a square like this and we have a dash like cut right here when i sort of undo the process i'm gonna get like a rectangle now like this that has a uh, like a little a little diamond thingamajig here because before it was folded like this like oops, it was folded like that so then when i unfold it vertically now i'm going to get a square with a little diamond cut out of it in the middle like that which is option option e i can confirm Awesome. Looks pretty correct. I cut up a legal document for this and confirmation oh. indeed. <laughs> There's a diamond in the middle. Sweet. Fantastic. Okay, actually, I should be doing some of these too, but I am actually still setting up some of my drawing. So if, they, if you don't mind, Elena, can you jump on to the next one and we'll run two more of you and then I'm going to be able to jump back in and draw. So go for it. Yeah, thank you. Oh, wow. So many words. Ah, wind chill is a measure of how cold people feel when exposed to wind outside. A good estimate for wind chill can be found using this calculation. Then they give us a formula wind shield equals air temperature minus 0 0.7 times wind speed, where temperature is measured in degrees Fahrenheit and wind speed is measured in miles per hour. Suppose the air temperature is 36 degrees Fahrenheit and the wind speed is 18 miles per hour. Which of the following is closest to the wind chill? Okay, well, 
it seems like what we are meant to do is we are given this formula here for taking an air temperature and wind speed and calculating wind chill. And luckily for us, this is exactly what we have. We're given the air temperature, 36 degrees Fahrenheit, which we can plug in here. And we're given wind speed, which is 18 miles per hour, which we can plug in over here. And this gives us exactly what we're looking for, which is wind chill. All right, so we can just plug in the numbers and do maybe some wonky calculations and see what this gets us. Air temperature, 36 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 0 0.7 times 18 miles per hour. Ah, this looks a little ugly. I don't know about you guys, but I am not liking 0 0.7 times 18. Are there any ways to do this without actually doing the math? Math is hard. Millie says I don't like decimal multiplication. I 100% agree with this. How do we deal with this? Ooh, okay, someone is suggesting using 18 almost as a common currency. So here we have 18 times 2, and we're subtracting 0 0.7 times 18. And so we should end up with 1.3 times 18, which is just a little bit more than 18, right? It's about 1.5 times 18. So we know it's definitely not 18, and now we just need to take something that's around half of 18, slightly less, and then add it onto 18. And, well, 28 is already bigger than 1.5 times 18, because 1.5 times 18 would be 3 halves of 18, which is 27. And 28 is bigger than 27, which means that without even multiplying, we know that the answer should be B23. Oh, the calculation. I, okay, yeah. Honestly, if I was doing that, I'd probably like just go for it with the decimals and the fractions, which probably isn't a good thing. Oh, well, um, it can be good. Many... I think I think this one's not that unruly that you could do this, but I am yeah. far too lazy to do actual arithmetic. That's fair, that's fair. All right, moving on to number four. Yes, four. The numbers from 1 to 49 are arranged in a spiral pattern on a square grid beginning at the center. The first few numbers have been entered into the grid below. Consider the four numbers that will appear in the shaded squares on the same diagonal as the number 7. How many of these four numbers are prime? Huh, okay. I'm going to close Zoom chat for this one because it's covering up the diagram. Actually, just kidding. I have another diagram. It's okay. We don't need to do that. All right. Right away, I don't really see a good way to figure out what these numbers are without just counting it. Unless anyone has any ideas. Um, I think, like, if we just go in a circle, like, keep counting, there's not that many. Like, the one next to seven would be eight, and then nine, and then ten. Nine, okay. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Like your first gray box would be 19. Oh, would be 19. And then you just keep counting 20, 21, 22, 23. The next one would be, oh, this is on top. Next one would be 23. Oh, my bad. 19, 23. There we go. 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39. And then the last gray box is 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47. 39 is 3 times 13. And for, uh, the other ones are all prime. So I guess the answer is 3 of them are prime, which is option D. Surely there's another way to do this problem. Is there, is there like an easier way to figure out uh, what the gray boxes are? I mean, is there a pattern? Maybe there's a pattern. Maybe. I am not quite sure. I mean, usually one would expect that there is a pattern maybe going like horizontally or vertically. This doesn't quite seem to be the case here because if you look at differences, for example, horizontally, we have yeah. uh, 
five, and then we have 13, and then the next one's 21, which, eh, kind of unruly numbers. Yeah, I don't actually see a nice pattern on that one either. So I think that one, unfortunately, is just a just do it type of question. Oh. Okay, maybe I'll do the next one. Let's see. So now the system I have should work. I have to I have to say, in fact, as you can see by now, our high school stars have much better equipment than I do. Uh, I'm actually joining you from a hotel room in Brooklyn. I was actually talking to students today at a school. But let me let me try to do the next one. So that involves reading. All of these questions have so many words. And one thing is, I, I know that reading is one of the hard things. So uh, I'm going to try to not read it too fast. So what we have here is that there's a lake and the lake contains 250 trout, along with a variety of other fish. When a marine biologist catches and releases a sample of 180 fish from the lake, 30 are identified as trout. Assume that the ratio of trout to the total number of fish is the same in both the sample and the lake. How many fish are there in the lake? Okay. I see. Okay, okay. So we're doing a ratio thing. So whenever I'm thinking about ratios, I like to, I guess, organize my thoughts into some kind of a chart. So inside the sample that we had, what, what did we have of the, let me, let me try to write this. Inside the sample that we have, how much did we have of, oops, I just accidentally pressed the wrong button and moved the problem statement. Let's go back. Okay, here we go. So if we want to, if we want to think about this, um, inside, the, inside the sample that we have, we had 30 trout trout. Let me do this. We have the trout, and there were 30, and the total, total number of fish was 180. Whenever I see things like that, I sort of wonder, is there a nicer ratio? And I already see it in the chat. People see that there's this ratio of one is to six. So that's because 18 is uh, three times six. So it looks like for every one trout, there are six total fish. Well, that's convenient because the problem tells me that there are 250 trout in the lake. So then what should I do? I see a lot of people have the answer now. I should take the 250. And if I'm going to go from 1 to 250, I multiply by 250. So I should also multiply by 250 to get from 6 to 6 times 250. How do you do that? Well, for me, if I'm multiplying 6 by 250, I see the 0. And I'm thinking of 6 times 25, for example. Multiplying by 25 is a nice thing to do because you, maybe you've noticed before, it goes 25, 50, 75, 100. So like every 4, you get 100. And 6 times 25 is 150 because 4 times 25 is 100, and then you get another 50. So that's 150. And there's another 0 because it had a zero at the end. So yes, people are putting all of these ideas in the chat. That's wonderful. And I'm going to guess that the answer is B. Is that right? Let's find out. Hmm. And my equipment is not as good as our high schoolers, but it looks like it is B. Okay, I survived. <laughs> Elena, on to you. Lovely. Okay. So our next question is... The digits 2, 0, 2, and 3 are placed in the expression below, one digit per box. What is the maximum possible value of the expression? Now, I guess one thing intuitively to notice right away is that we definitely don't want 0 in the base. Because if we have 0 as either of these bottom numbers, then our product will be 0. And this is just clearly bad. Clearly we can do better. I am optimistic that there exist better ways out there. So this means that if zero is not in either base box, it must be in one of the exponent boxes. So you can put a zero here, then we're left with the digits two, two, and three. And from here, it's not that much casework. We can either put two to the zero times two to the three, in which case we get one times eight, or we can do 3 to the 0 times 2 to the 2, which is 1 times 4. Or we can do 2 to the 0 times 3 to the 2, which is 1 times 9, 
And of these three choices, this one is clearly the best. We have 9 over here, and this corresponds to answer choice C. Awesome. Um, I guess it also kind of makes sense that you probably want three to be on the bottom because it's bigger. But, or at least well, you want three to not be with this zero because then this is the three true. Goes away. But also, yeah. I think this does not always work, right? If we were working with some larger numbers, for example, yeah. uh, I don't know, two to the five twelve would be much, much bigger than yeah. five twelve to the two. So because the numbers are small, we kind of have to do a bunch of casework and actually test the numbers. But if we had some numbers with larger differences, putting them in the exponents, especially putting larger numbers in the exponents, would actually have much more of an effect than it has here. Yeah, that's a really good observation. I mean, a really good comment. It's that actually my, my instinct would have been to put the bigger thing in the exponent because mm -hmm. it's much more exciting to multiply a number by itself more times. But this is a trick question in the sense that you want to put the three down in the base instead. Um, awesome. Okay, moving on to number seven now. Oh my god, so many words. A <laughs> rectangle with sides parallel to the x-axis and the y-axis has opposite vertices located at 15, 3, and 16, 5. A line is drawn through points A and B at 0, 0, and 3, 1. Another line is drawn through points C and D at 0, 10, and 2, 9. How many points on the rectangle line at least one of the two lines. Okay, so I guess we can just see where the lines intersect with the rectangle and then count how many points that happens at. Um, awesome, okay, so luckily the first line AB is at the origin and that's nice because we know that this the slope of the line is just one over three because it goes up one over three. So the equation of the line is just y equals one third x. And we know that the rectangle is at 15 comma three and then 16 comma five. So if we just see where like the y value is for that line, um, when it's at x equals 15, um, the y value would be like y equals 15 over three, which is equal to five. And we notice that that hits the rectangle like at this y value so um uh, looking at the rectangle it would be somewhere oh that's off it would be somewhere on the top uh left corner right there somewhere in that this uh corner is where it would hit and then notice that after that it just keeps going up and up past that corner so it doesn't hit the rectangle again so oh oops so for the first like line AB, it hits the rectangle in one place. And we'll keep that in mind while we do this second line. Second line CD has a slope of negative one half because it goes down and then over two, and then it starts at 10. So the equation is like minus one half X plus 10. And again, we do the same thing with 15 comma three, and 16 comma 5 we see where this uh like the y value is and at 15 the y is minus 15 over 2 plus 10 which is equal to 5 over 2 and obviously this is like way like because our rectangle starts at 3 so 5 over 2 is 2.5 which is less than the bottom left corner of the rectangle so it doesn't hit the rectangle anywhere because it just goes below the rectangle entirely. So between the two lines, it hits the rectangle in one place, which is with A, B. So I think the answer is just one. And yeah. that is correct. Also. Yes, it's just one. Actually, it's kind of tricky with this question. I thought we'd have these lines cross a few more times, but it didn't. I guess afterwards you can kind of look at it and just say that looks kind of slopey. So maybe it slopes too much. Oh, wow. Actually, now I'm wondering on the actual exam, did they give you a diagram? Let me tell you a sneaky trick. If they actually gave you a diagram and the diagram was drawn to scale, you can grab a piece of paper and a piece of paper becomes a straight line. I I'm actually now very curious. Did you guys get diagrams on the actual test? Oh, you did? And so if you just grab a piece of paper, that's a wonderful line. 
and you just like make a line, right? And you just go and see how many times this intersects with the graph. How convenient. Okay, great. I think I'm up next. Let's see what's next. Hmm. Oops, what just happened? Oh, right, here we go. Okay, I'm on this question. Oh my, Lola, Lolo, Tia, and Tio participated in a ping pong tournament. Each player competed against each of the other three players exactly twice. Okay, shown below are the win-loss records for the players. The numbers one and zero represent a win or a loss, respectively. For example, Lola won five matches and lost the fourth match. What was Tio's win-loss record? Oh, this is interesting. Okay, so I like these problems where it's not like there's already a, a known technique to do it, but we have to puzzle through this whole thing. And when I'm thinking about this, I'm like, hmm, well, every single time that there is a match, win-loss records, the first five matches. Interesting. Now I'm looking at this, trying to figure out if these matches are all at the same time. So I see six columns. The reason there are six columns is because each player played against each of the other three players exactly twice. Actually, at first I'm trying to even understand this question. So when I'm looking at this, I'm like, how many games are being played anyway? So there are, from, from my point of view, if I was one of the players, uh, suppose I'm Lola, how many games, how many people am I playing? Well, I'm going to play against three players, but I'm going to play against each of the three players twice. So I'll have six, six different games that I play. Okay, that's right. So that's why each one of these rows has six numbers inside it. Okay, and then if there are these six numbers inside them, I'm trying to think of how these matches are called because it's actually not that the first column is that all four of these players played. That's not the case. However, I'm wondering, okay, I'm wondering if this question has enough information because a little bit of me is saying if every match has a winner and a loser, then I'm thinking that every column should have two ones and two zeros. But I'm not actually really happy with that observation because it doesn't say that the, that the matches are all in order either. But the reason I'm, I'm thinking this is because somehow in every, single, in every single situation, well, you have a winner and a loser of the game. So I'm wondering if the way to read this is that maybe Lola's first match, ah, it's, it's possible. Maybe Lola's first match was playing Tia or something. And if Lola, Lola played Tia, then Lola beat Tia. And then maybe Lolo played Tio and Lolo beat Tio. Could I imagine that that works? So by the way, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to, a, a bit of my gut is just saying, since I look at the columns and I don't see any columns that have three ones or three zeros, I can make an answer by just saying that um, I'm going to make it so that every column has two ones and two zeros inside it. The reason I'm not happy with that 100% is because it's not clear that these are really going in order of the games. Because if the first game was the people playing, Maybe, this, uh, maybe first game is these two people playing, second game is these two people playing. Well then, what's the third game? I don't even know. Is the third game that Lola plays Lolo? Because I'm just wondering if these things at some point get shifted off track. But regardless, since I see that there's no column with all three ones and all three zeros, then that means that I could try to just say whatever one is missing from getting an even number of ones and zeros in each column. And then I'll try to reconstruct what actually happened in the game. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to hide the, hide the chat just a second because it's covering up some of the picture. Not that I don't like your ideas. Your ideas are great, but I'm just going to write down my idea and then we'll compare, okay? So let me go over here. And if I was going to do that, well then, if I just simply said, what do I do to make there be two ones and two zeros, I would be, that's a one, that's a zero, that's a zero, that's a one, that's a zero, and that's a one. And I want to know, is that even an answer choice? One, zero, oh no, it's not, oh, oh, oh no, no, what did I do? The first one's wrong. The first one is not a, not a, it's not a one. First one is, oops, let me do this. I just realized that my undo feature is messy on this. So I'm just gonna do changing the one into a zero. That's another way. So this would be a way of having balance. Is that an option? 
Okay, it looks like A is an option. Let me let me bring the chat back. What are people talking about? Oh, a lot of people are saying A. And then people were also telling me, first one is a zero, okay? So, so far, a lot of people are telling me A. And now if I look at this, I'm just trying to figure out, could I tell a story here of who was playing who? And this is just what will make me happier about this question. It could be that in the first round, Lola... Oh, just a second. I've just moved a lot of things out of the way. Let me come back. No, I'm back there. And this... That's me. Oh no. Okay, I just accidentally moved myself out of the way. Here, let's do this. We'll bring the problem back another time. But um, but what what I wanted to say is yeah. So we'll we'll bring the problem back another time. But oh, I found it. No, that's actually something else. Yeah. So so we'll bring the problem back another time. But but the, but the point is that it looks like this is how we balance it. And let me just see: is that actually correct? So because I unfortunately was just clicking in the wrong place. So maybe your team can tell me, is that correct? Because I would be moving my thing back while they tell me. Uh, I believe it is, yeah. Okay. okay, well, in that case, that's good. Uh, did any of you have any other insights on that yeah. particular question? The problem said in the problem statement that Lola won five matches and lost her fourth match. And the, like, the zero was in like the fourth position. So I guess that kind of like, leads you to the idea that it goes one, two, three, four in the matches. So then like in every column, it's like that's everyone's second match. And then and then you compare it like a one zero and a zero one because there are no draws. Uh, but I, I guess that's like not completely clear. And that's so reassuring to know though. It's nice that they give us the information to feel more confident. Yeah. Great. Right. Well pass it on to you guys. Elena, I think. All right, problem nine. Malaika is skiing on a mountain. The graph below shows her elevation in meters above the base of the mountain as she skis along a trail. In total, how many seconds does she spend at an elevation between four and seven meters? All right, so it seems like this question is mostly about being able to read the graph. And so for Reading the graph, I guess what's important to note is what's on the x and the y axis. So here we have time in seconds, uh, which is good because we are asked a question about time spent in a certain place. Seems like we want to be looking at that axis to figure out what's going on with time. And then on the y axis, we have the elevation, which is also good because we are also asked about elevation. So we are looking for elevation between four and seven meters. And this corresponds to the lines uh, y equals four and y equals seven, and the region between them. So let's add these lines into our diagram. And what we probably want to do is see where these lines intersect our graph, because this will help us locate the time coordinates uh, that are spent within the region. So we have an intersection here at 2, we have an intersection here at 4, another intersection at 6, another one at 10, uh, 12, and 14. Now we just have to contextualize what this actually means. I guess before the first intersection point, we are outside this elevation range. So before two, this is bad time, and we don't want to count this one. Then from two to four, our segment is contained entirely between the four and seven span. So from two to four, this is a good time span and seconds that we want to count. Then from four to six, we again dip below the y equals four line, and this is a bad interval. Then from 6 to 8, we are again between them. So this is a good interval. And then just a few intervals left. This one goes above the 7 line. So from 10 to 12 is bad. And then 12 to 14 is good. And then again after 14, we dip for the last time below the y equals 4 line. And this is a bad interval. So 
it seems like we have some quantity of good intervals and we have how long they happen for. So we can just add these times together. We go from two to four and then from six to 10 and then 12 to 14. So the first segment is two seconds. The second segment is four seconds. And the third segment is also two seconds. And when we add all of these times together, we get that the total time spent, as you guys are saying in chat, I see from Lucy Wang, eight seconds in total in the good region. And this corresponds to answer choice B. Um, all right. Uh, moving on to number 10 now. Okay, Harold made a plum pie. I've never had plum pie. Interesting. Harold made a plum pie to take on a picnic. He was able to eat only one fourth of the pie and he left the rest of it for his friends. A moose came by and ate one third <laughs> of what Harold left behind. After that, a porcupine ate one third of what the moose left behind. How much of the original pie still remained after the porcupine left? Uh, okay. So for this problem, right away, I mean, I feel like what I would be inclined to do if I hadn't seen something like this before would be to let like the pie be like X or something and then try to go through the steps of like the moose ate one fourth, he had three fourths left and then try to make an equation of how much the porcupine left at the end. But that's uh, like it works, but it's quite long and also painful if there's a lot of different steps. So what I'm gonna do is like a common strategy, which is like doing it from the back because the process is probably gonna be much nicer from behind. At least I think it is. So let's try. Uh, right away, I'm gonna let X be like the fraction of, oh, oops, that's on top of the words. I'm gonna let X be the fraction of pi that, or like the amount of pi that the porcupine left behind after he finished. So basically X is what we're trying to find. Um, and from, okay, the porcupine ate one third of what was left. So basically before the porcupine ate pi, I had like some, like some amount of pi, right? And then I ate one third of that. And then I subtracted that. So sort of like two thirds of P of what I had before the porcupine ate is equal to X, which means if I want to, so I went from P to X, like the process went from P to X, right? When I ate one third, I'm going to hide chat for this one because chat is going like pretty big. When I went from P to X, I ate one third of the pi and then um, X is like what's left over. So X is two thirds of P. When I want to go backwards from X to P, what I'm going to do is multiply by three halves. Because if this is equal to X, right? If this is equal to X, if I multiply by three halves, I get P is equal to three halves X. So reversing the process, I just multiply by three halves X. And this is nice because um, I can reverse the process again because the moose also just ate one third of the pie of what he had of the pie. So he would also just eat, um, he would have had three halves times three halves of X before he ate the pie. And using a similar strategy, we can reverse the process of the one fourth because um, after Harold ate one fourth of the pie, he had three fourths of the pie left. So to reverse the process, we just multiply by four thirds. So in the end, I have this much of pie at the beginning. And luckily, this cancels with this, leaving us with 3x. So in the beginning, I had 3x, or like, three, yeah, 3x is my amount of pi. And at the end, I had x. So how much of the original pi remained would just be x over 3x, or one third of the pi. Okay. Is that the right answer? 
I actually didn't look at the answer yet. Let, oh. let me let me just share another way. Maybe I'll, I'll share another way since I didn't look at the answer yet. So I just saw what you did. This this is this also works. By the way, it's important to have lots of different ways to do every question, and that's why whenever we do this, we have a couple of us who are all looking at it differently. Um, maybe I'll just share something that I I thought when I saw this, um, because I think Aria was also trying to very carefully explain out how you might be able to reason through this with uh, with, with with the method that he used. There's a there's another way that sometimes you can just write a little diagram of what happens. So I like to, I'm a very visual thinker. So I like to think, okay, at the beginning, I have a whole pie. That's a one. But then at some point, Harold comes along. After Harold comes along, how much of the pie is left? That's actually what I'm going to write down. So if Harold ate one quarter of the pie, how much of the pie is left over after Harold? Well, feel free to type in the chat, of course, because this is how everything can go here. I want one step at a time. I'm trying to make this so that this is as welcoming as possible for people who are who are starting to learning, right? So Harold ate only one quarter. So what's left, thank you, is that there's three quarters left after Harold. But then after Harold, what happened? Then the moose came by. So fortunately, moose is a different letter. So moose came by. And if the moose came by and ate one third of what was left behind, well, how much does the moose leave behind? The moose, I'll write this way, times two thirds. And this is the same, this is the same kind of stuff that, that Aria was actually doing anyway, right? But the idea is that Harold, what Harold does when I'm thinking about how much pie is left behind after Harold times three quarters, because Harold ate one quarter. And then the moose ate one third of what was left. So after the moose is gone, you multiply by two thirds to see how much is left. It's always multiplying because that's just how much is going to be left afterwards. And then porcupine shows up. And porcupine will eat uh, one third of what the moose left behind. And I think we're coming up with times two thirds again. So this is actually the same calculation that, uh, that Arya was doing ultimately. But it's just a way of thinking of how much is left as you keep going through. And hopefully that's the answer. So you said diagram? I think I took it a little bit the wrong way. <laughs> it does the same thing, but there's slightly more porcupine on it than in yours. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, some some people have better skills at actually drawing <laughs> the diagram, which works too. Yes. Thank you. That is That's an amazing cool. porcupine. Thank you. Uh, I tried to channel Sonic, even though he's a hedgehog, which I realize now. Okay. But it looks like a porcupine. <laughs> That's a good porcupine. Okay. Was that was the answer one third, by the way? Did anyone check the answer? Oh, I should probably check that. Ah, uh, yes, it is. Awesome. Cool. Then I think I'm next. So let me see what I've got here. So NASA's Perseverance rover was launched on July 30th, 2020. After traveling a lot of miles. Do I really need that number? I hope not. <laughs> it landed on Mars in Jezero Crater about 6.5 months later. Which of the following is closest to the rover's average interplanetary speed in miles per hour? Ah, okay. So I won't need to use all those digits. I need to know approximately. And at first I look at the answer choices to see, to see how, how precise do I have to be. And what I'm seeing is it's like, these are a factor of two apart. These are a factor of five apart. Factor of two apart, factor of five apart. So I can afford to make mistakes up to a factor of two or a factor of five. So I'm going to make a tiny mistake. I'm going to change this to 300, 300 million, right? Because from 20, to, from 290 to 300 million, how much ratio of a mistake have I made? Actually, very little. The ratio of mistake is like 292 to 300 ish, which is nothing like one is to two. One is to two would be like making a mistake from 292 to like 584 or something like that. And 300 is close enough. So in that case, what do I have? I have 300, uh, 300 million miles. That's too hard to write. So I'm going to write it as three times 10 to the power something miles. Can anybody tell me three times 10 to the power what? So... I want to write a power instead of writing all these zeros. Well, it should be three with how many zeros after. That's how you think of this, right? So I have, I can see in the picture, I can see three zeros, three more zeros, and two more zeros, eight zeros. Thank you, everyone in the chat. So it's three times 10 to the power eight miles, okay? 
And then uh, I need to know miles per hour. Oh, that means I need to know how many hours there are. So the number of hours is 6.5, right? No, that's not good. 6.5 is the number of months. That's the number of months. I need to turn months into hours. So if I want to turn months into hours, uh, let me turn months into days first. Yikes. Some days have 30 days. Some days have 29 days. Some days have 28 days. Some days have some months. Of, wait, what did I say? Some months. Months of, I don't know what I said. But like, it's somewhere around 30. Let's call it 30. So this many months times 30 days in a month. Now that's in days. And then I need to change this into, uh, into hours. So how many hours are in a day? I think the number of hours in a day is this nice number called 25. I hope you'll forgive me. So the number of hours in a day is now 25. And hopefully this is close enough. So this is now hours. So now the question is, can I multiply all the bottom numbers? Can I take the top number divided by all the bottom ones multiplied together? So uh, I, I like these numbers because 6.5 times 30, then I will be able to get rid of the zero. So I have six, 65 times three. <laughs> yeah, you like my 25 hours in a day. I hope that is okay. So, so if I've got this over here. I have 6.5 times three. Um, six times three is 18. I'm just doing this in my head. So six times three is 18. Uh, 0.5 times three is 1.5. So I'm seeing 195, 19. 195. So this is 195 times 25 hours. Okay. Uh, 195 is very, very close to 200. So it's now 200. Two hundred times 25. This is okay. That's equal to, what's 200 times 25? Uh, that's 5,000. So finally, I need to take my 3 times 10 to the power 8 divided by 5,000. And you're saying there's so much rounding. But every time I'm doing this rounding, I'm being very careful. It's like the 24 to 25, that's a very small mistake. Uh, the 195 to 200, that's also a very small mistake. And ultimately, I am I'm able to be off by a factor of all the way up to 2. So this is OK. And you're wondering why I rounded the number of hours in the day to 25. It is for simplicity. It's because that's easier for me to multiply. Because now I just have to divide these two numbers. So 3 times 10 to the power 8 divided by 5,000. What's that? Here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to say it's 30 times 10 to the power 7. Yikes. My pen is not as good as our wonderful stars here. So this many to the power 7. OK, that's the number of hours, the number of miles divided by the number of hours, which is 5,000, I'll call 5, times 10 cubed, okay? Times 10 cubed. And this should be nice, because this is coming out to 30 divided by 5 is 6, times 10 to the power 4. Okay, I'm going to guess C. It also ran into my head. So let's see. Let's see if it's C. Is it C? Hmm. Okay, I'm going to go click around. Is it C? Oh, it is C. It's correct. Okay, I want to make one comment about the so much rounding. So you might be worried, like, am I doing too much rounding? Well, I, again, I was always being careful. You, you, you compound the errors whenever you round. So if I rounded and I was off by like 50%, and then I did it again, I could be off by a lot more. I could be off by, you know, 1.5 times 1.5, which is uh, which is quite bad. That's 2.25. Uh, but on the other hand, what I was doing is I was always being careful when the rounding is maybe in the one digit away. So my errors are like 10% error or 1% error or some, some, something around there. And I'm, I'm willing to do mistakes of picking up another 10% error, another 10% error a bunch of times because I can go all the way to an entire 100% error. That's like this times two. That's roughly my thinking process. So I was willing to do a few rounds. OK, and one more comment I'll make is that the rounds sometimes went down and sometimes went up. So there's this interesting thing that happens when you're rounding both ways. In fact, you can do more roundings uh, without blowing yourself all the way out in the sense that if you make like a 10% error each way, but you keep doing it in the opposite direction, some of them cancel each other out. OK.
I wonder if my co-stars have anything they wanted to add on this too. Actually, I think it's really nice that you use scientific notation to keep track of all the zeros. I think it's very, it's a very good idea, especially when you have something like 10 to the 8th or like 10 to the 9th. Uh, you can get lost in your zeros, especially on contests where you're writing very quickly. You tend to like scribble and then all of your zeros start looking wonky and then you miscount your zeros. I did that one year. That was an oops. Um, so scientific notation is a really good idea, especially because it allows you to take advantage of exponent laws. So when we did the division of 10 to the 7th by 10 to the 3rd, you just do subtraction in your exponents. And then this makes it a little easier and neater in your scratch work. Yeah. Awesome. Meanwhile, I see that people like your rocket as well. So <laughs> <laughs> very good. OK, so that finishes mine. I'll pass it back to Elena. You're next. I guess I can take this rocket over to the next problem. Yeah. <laughs> All right. The figure below shows a large unshaded circle with a number of smaller unshaded and shaded circles in its interior. What fraction of the interior of the large unshaded circle is shaded? Huh. It almost feels like we don't have enough information because we're not given any radii, and I feel like I kind of need radii to find areas of circles. Oh, Albert says to make things easier, we can assume that the unit is one. Oh, this is actually very smart. This is very, very smart, because say we choose some kind of scaling for this diagram. When we take, it asks for the ratio, right? What fraction of the area? and this means that we can actually assume a scale, because when we assume a scale, when we take a ratio between one scaled area and another scaled area, the scale factor will cancel out. So it is actually OK to assume some numbers as long as we're consistent and don't assume different scales for each thing. So OK, what's the best scale here? I think initially I'm tempted to just make one of these like unit squares one unit. But upon looking at it, I really dislike fractions, and it seems like these three smaller circles, their diameter is this unit length. So I'm going to assume that the unit length is 2, and that way I can hopefully avoid some fractions, which will make my computation a little bit easier. So we will assume that one unit square is actually two unit squares. Then I guess we can just start computing. So we want to find the radii of all of these circles. That way we can find all of their areas and then we can add together shaded and unshaded regions and take the fraction at the end to figure out how much is shaded. So for the big circle, this is three of our unit squares, which gives us a big radius of six. And then we can focus on this one. This one is two of these unit squares. So this should give us, we can call this medium. Our medium circle, which is this one here, has radius 4. And scaling down a little bit, one of these medium small circles has a radius of 1 unit square. And since 1 unit square is 2 units, it has a radius of 2. And then finally, our tiniest circles. Our tiniest circles, which are these three over here, have radius 1. So now all that's left to do is use our area formulas to find the areas of all of these circles, and then correctly add and subtract the areas to get the regions that we want. OK, so we are looking for, I guess, what we need to find the total area of the big circle. And then we need to find the shaded area. So we can do the big circle first, because this is probably the easiest step. We have the radius already, 6. So this should be 6 squared pi for the area of the big circle. Now we can find the shaded regions. So it seems like these three small circles don't have any in impediments on them, right? We can just add them in. And this should be good to count them. So their radii are all 1. And we have three of them, so three times one times pi. Now this area, this area is interesting because it's such an irregular shape. We can't just add a circle and have it fill the shape. Actually, what we need to do is 
I think we need to add this circle here and then subtract these two smaller circles here. Because what we're essentially doing is we are taking this entire region and then we are erasing these two regions. And this gives us our funky shape here. And I think this would be good enough to get all of our shaded regions. So for our medium size, we determine that the radius is 4. So this should be plus 4 squared pi. And then we subtract 2 of our medium small circles. So minus 2 times 2 squared pi. And now we need to do a lot of math. And math is kind of hard. Okay, well, well, at least, at least we don't have to drag around this pi. We have a pi in every single term. So we can cancel out the pi already, and then we're dealing with just nice, pretty numbers. Canceling things is always fun. Brings me so much joy. Cool. And then, math. 3 plus 16 minus, this is 4, so 4 times 2, 8, over 36. And this is looking like, uh, is this 11 over 36? Seems right. And this is an answer choice. So we did our math correctly, or at least hopefully correctly. Otherwise, it wouldn't be an answer choice unless they were very, very rude. 11 over 36. And that's correct. Yes, I, I checked the answer. Hey. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. Actually, this is good. I also got the 11 over 36. And so I was doing it at the same time as you. Um, I have a little bit of advantage because I also can see what people are saying in the chat and getting inspired by them. But so first of all, thank you, Elena, for doing this question. And I should also emphasize, we always, whenever we teach classes, we like to use the ideas in the chat because sometimes interesting things come up. So one thing that I thought of when I looked at this inspired by the chat is that, you see, if I care about ratios, can anyone tell me what the ratio is between one of these small circles and the big one? Let's just do the whole thing in ratios without even areas. If I have a small circle and a big circle, well, what's the ratio of their diameters? That's actually the easiest way to think of it. The ratio of their diameters is one is two, one is the six is the ratio of diameters. And I had the inspiration that it's probably something like that because I see all these 36s here. So actually, each of these small shaded things is one sixth of the area. No, it's one thirty sixth of the area, right? So each one of these things. Oh, yes, I need to go and click over here. Again, it's because I do not have as fancy a setup as our, as our high schoolers, but let's do this. These things, each of these is one over 36 of the area. So I got three over 36 right here. And then the game becomes, how much is this? And a fun thing is Elena did it. She did the hard work to find out that actually the area of this part is one half of the area of this circle. I guess I, I've seen this puzzle a lot in math contests where you have a circle and then you draw these two circles in here and half of the area is in this unshaded and half of the area is in the shaded among that thing. Um, and that's also because you can think of it as saying the, the diameter of one of these is one half of the diameter of the whole thing. So if the diameter scales one is to two, the area scale one is to four and there's two of them. So it's two fourths, so it's one half. Anyway, so the point is that when you look at a picture like this, the shaded part and the unshaded part are actually the same. These two shaded parts add up to the two unshaded parts. Well then, the next thing I could ask is how much of the a fraction of the big circle is this guy? Well, this guy here has a diameter, which is 2 is to 6. So this thing is, the, 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 the ratio of diameters of one of these circles is 2 is to 6. So the ratio of the areas is 4 is to 36. And I'm talking about 4 is to 36, meaning the area of this circle here to the big circle. Which, by the way, the reason I'm thinking about the, the circles is because the, these uh, shaded pieces the area of the shaded pieces is the same as the area of the unshaded pieces. They balance. So actually, I can just take the 1 over 36, another 1 over 36, another 1 over 36. There's three of them here. And then each of these two parts is going to be 2 over 6 squared. So each of those is 4 over 36. For 
each of these. And when you add it all together, you get Elena's answer also. But again, I, I had the advantage of watching the chat and thinking about it while the whole thing was going. Actually, I also just had the advantage of watching chat. Uh, there was one question about why you took the ratio of 1 to 6 when looking at the diameters of the circles. And we get this from the picture. So our big circle spans six of these grid squares, while one of these small circles spans only one. So their diameters, which is the distance across the circle, is 1 to 6. And we actually have this thing where when you have a proportionality constant in one dimension to get the ratio between areas, we can square it. So that's how we got 1 over 36. And Luke in chat had another great idea, which is that this problem could actually work just as well with squares instead of circles. And this is true. You can change this to any shape as long as you have this like wonky intersectional area. Or it doesn't have to be this shape, but as long as you have overlapping things uh, in such a way. Uh, you can use any shape, and that's a really good observation, is these ratio constants between areas work no matter what your shape is, as long as you have similarity. Yeah, that's great. One comment I'm going to make, we are at the top of the hour, but we're only on question 12. So we're willing to stick around and go all the way and power through question 15. Um, I know that some of you may only have arranged for one hour to be here, but uh, any of you who can stay longer, we're going to have some more fun with a few more questions. Ari, I think you're up next. Okay, um, yeah, let's do it. Number 13 now. Oh, I get hit with the words. Okay. <laughs> Along the route of a bicycle race, seven water stations are evenly spaced between the start and the finish lines, as shown in the figure below. There are also two repair stations evenly spaced between the start and the finish lines. The third water station is located two miles after the first repair station, how long is the race in miles? Okay, so right away, I'm going, we notice that since the water stations are evenly spaced, there's like eight evenly spaced regions because there's seven water stations. So if we let like the one, the distance between two water stations be X, we can have like the total, like total distance, equals 8x, because there's eight of those little regions. And now let's see what other information we're given. We're given that the, the there's like two repair stations, which means there's going to be like start to first repair station, and then repair station to second repair station, second repair station to the end. So there's three evenly spaced regions created by that. Um. So hey, I guess... Arya, did you perform a magic trick? I think your chat went poof. We can't see okay. them. <laughs> yeah, I think, okay. I proofed it back. Whoa, so cool. That's crazy. Okay, uh, thank you for reminding me about that. Um, so the third water station, we're given some information here, is located two miles after the first repair station. So if we think about this in terms of like a little line, oh, I'm going to have to proof, actually, We'll do it. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to get rid of chat for a second. Uh, this is unfortunate, but I will bring it back. If we draw a little picture of like a line, let this be like the first water station, second water station, and then the third water station. The third water station is located two miles after the first repair station. Okay, so like right here, we can say this is the first repair station. And we notice that this distance is two miles because it's located two miles before that, which means that the distance from the beginning to the first um, repair station is going to be 3x, like because we have x, x, and then we have x minus 2 over here. So the, to the distance from the beginning to the water station is 3x minus 2. And since they're evenly spaced, this means that the total distance can also be represented as 3 times 3x minus 2. And since these things are both equal, we can come down here and we have an equation in x that we can solve. And solving for x, we get x equals 6. And now to be careful that we're answering the question that was asked, the race, the entire distance is 8x, which is going to be 8 times 6, which is 48.
Um, Ooh, I think that is actually the correct answer. Awesome. I checked. Let's go. Actually, I'm just going to make another comment just because I see this. It's always great to have all these different ways to do questions. And that one was one with the axes. Um, I'll, I'll share something which is, again, inspired by getting to watch other people work. Uh, and I think it's, it's always healthy to do this kind of a thing. Uh, whenever you do a problem yourself, do it your way and then go and see how other people did it and see if they inspire you to think about their stuff. Another way to think of this is to draw out a line, a number line of some form and say, here's the beginning. Here's the end. And if I say that the end is just called one, these are like fractions. Can anyone tell me water station number one? What fraction would that be? What fraction is water station number one? We actually saw it in Arya's work because Arya did something with X and then there were eight of them. And so that's the tricky thing. There are seven water stations, but there are eight gaps. So this is in fact one over eight. So the water station number one is at position one over eight. Well, that means that water number two is here. And then water number three is at three over eight. Okay, but I also have the repair stations. There are two repair stations equally spaced. And where are those two repair stations? Well, the repair stations, I can also say fractions now, right? Where's repair number one? Repair number one is going to be some other fraction. What fraction would that be? Yes, I see answers coming in. It's at one third. Okay, so now if I think about it, how do three eighths and one third compare on the number line? Actually, the problem said that the three eighths is ahead of, is, is to this direction of the one third. So there's a one third somewhere on this number line. That's the repair station number one. That's one third. And this is illegible, so I'm going to try to be a little bit higher. And then the water station, here's the one third. And then here's the water station at three eighths. And um, how can I use these two fractions? So I know that on the number line, that's a one third, that's a three eighths. And somehow in between them is uh, two miles, right? It's two miles. So in that case, what this means is that the difference between these two fractions is two miles. And I can use that to figure out what the one is. So uh, what do I mean? So if I take the difference between these two fractions, that corresponds to two miles. Then you undo that ratio and you find out what the one is because this one is actually this, the, the total distance. I guess, I guess that's the question we're trying to figure out. I'm going to call that D because there was an X that was used in, in Arius. So I don't, want to, I don't want to reuse the X. But I can actually say these are all, these are all fractions. They're fractions of the full distance, which is D. So actually this one third and three eighths Basically, the algebraic thing is 3 eighths minus 1 third distance. That's equal to 2 miles. And then you can use this idea to actually figure out what the, what the distance is now. Because then I just take the difference between the fractions. Um, and again, this is the same kind of calculation we just had. Let's do this faster now. This is 24. Uh, 9 minus 8 d equals two. And so that's one over 24. D is equal to two. Like something's wrong with my pen, equals to two. And D equals to 48. So this is just another way of coming up with the same thing. But I just wanted to do this because it was inspired by what I'd seen. Okay. With that, I'm gonna keep on going because I think it's my turn next. So where are we? Oh, Nicholas, oh, this one has a lot of words, is planning to send a package to his friend Anton, who is a stamp collector. To pay for the postage, Nicholas would like to cover the package with a, with a large number of stamps. Suppose he has a collection of five cent, 10 cent, and 25 cent stamps with exactly 20 of each type. What is the greatest number of stamps Nicholas can use to make exactly $7.10 in postage? Note, the amount $7.10 corresponds to $7.10. $1 is worth 100 cents. It's very nice that this explains how to do it for people who don't use dollars and cents. Uh, 20 of each type. Okay. Hmm. I don't like these questions because it's easy to get them wrong. Okay. Uh, I would start by saying, let's use as many of the little steps as we can. So this is the greedy algorithm. And what I'll do is I'll say, let's take all 20 of the five cent stamps. Is that good? Oh, I see where we have to be careful. 
We have to be careful because I need to have the dollars 10, okay? And if I look at the 25 cent stamps, those are only gonna, those are not gonna give me a 10 cent left over. So it looks like I need to come up with a 10 cent left over from the fives and the tens. And I can see that if I take 20 of the five cent, five cent stamps, let me see if I can write here. So if I take 20 of the five cent stamps, I already got 100 cents. I'm doing the whole thing in cents. And then if I want to use the 10 cent stamps, I need to somehow have a 10 cents remaining. And if I took all 20 of them, that's a, a flat $2. So that's not going to give me any extra remaining. So I can't use all 20 of them. So now I need to dial back and think, what's the, what's the closest I could get? Oh, this is tricky. I see what's going on here. So this, this is tricky in the following sense. So I cannot go all the way to 20 of the 10 cent coins, uh, 10 cent steps. And one thing I could do, I want to come back to having like an extra 10 after. So if I went to 16 of them, this gives me 160. Okay. And by the way, I thought of going back to the 160 because if I add this together, it's 260, and then I can add a bunch of 25s and I can get to exactly 710 because 60 plus 50 gives me a 10. So one way I could do this is with this plus this plus a number of 25 cent coins, steps, 25 cent steps. And the whole thing needs to add to 710. So I'm going to try subtracting 710 minus 160. What is that? 550, I think. So then 450 is left. I think that adds up to 710. Yes, that adds up to 710. So then I need to figure out what times 25 is 450. And the way to get that is um, 400. Well, 100 is four of them. We did that earlier today. 425 gives you 100. So if I want 400, that's 16 of them. And then I get 18 to get, four, to get 450. I think. Please correct me if I did anything wrong here. But um, so far, this is one way of getting it. And I could add up how many steps I have here, 20, 16, 18. But there's a tricky thing. Because then I'm wondering, is it actually really that good that I gave up so many of these stamps? Because dropping from 20 10 cent stamps down to 16 10 cent stamps, 10 cent stamps I lost four, step, four of the stamps. And I had to do that because I had to come down to something for which it could match, um, where I could add 25s to go and build up to the whole uh, the whole hundred, uh, well, with the 25 is to build up the whole 710. But there's another way I could do this. I could actually do some trading and I could try to get another, uh, I could try to get one less 25 cent stamp. And I could try to make this number bigger. What am I trying to say? Hmm. What I mean is, if I want to get more stamps, if I can, if I can turn a 25 cent stamp, Wait, is that how I want to think of this? Let me slow down. So I, I'm, what I'm thinking about to slow down is I want to get one, I want to get 95 here instead. I'm just curious if this is any better. What if I had 19 times five? Now that's 95. Okay, 19 times five is 95. I wonder if we can do any better now. Because if I have 95, now, how far away am I from 710? Um, if I took all 20 of the 10 cent stamps, that will give me something 95. I'm trying to take the 710 and subtract 25 cents. That's actually what I'm trying to do in my head. 710 minus 25 cents is um, 685. So I wonder if I can get to 85. And I think I can get to 85 with 19 times 10. Again, I'm going to try to do this in a way where I can draw. 19 times 10, that's equal to 190. Okay. Now, these two add up interestingly. These two add up to 285. I think 285 is good because from 285, I can go all the way to a 10 after. Okay. Because 85 plus 25 is 10. So I want something times 25 equals, well, I have to now take 710 minus this thing. So I'm going to do some arithmetic. I want to do 710 minus, we said that was 285. 
that's a five, uh, that's two, uh, that's four, four twenty-five. Now, how many 25s is that? Well, it's going to be one less because uh, 18 of them gave, gave me 450, so that's 17. Is this better? I have a gut feeling this is better. 19 plus 19 plus 17, because these are closer to 20. So this is like 38 plus 17, which is something. 35, uh, 38 plus 17, is it 55? Yeah, because this is like 20, 20. Uh, this, is like, this is like adding 40 and then subtracting two. So I can take 17 plus 40 is 57 and then minus two. I'm getting out to 55. Is this right? Actually, I did it another way and I got 55 as well. So I'm pretty confident. Okay. And I do want to share my other Tell way. Tell me your way, yeah. Because it is a little bit shorter in the arithmetic. See, oh, I good. noticed when you were doing your arithmetic, your numbers of stamps are pretty close to 20. So I was thinking, what if I start with 20 of each one and then work my way down to 710? And maybe if they're close enough, then this will be a little bit less computation. So what I did for this is I took 20 of each stamp. So 25 plus 15, not 15, uh, plus 10 plus 5. And this gives us, with some arithmetic, a total of $8, which is only 90 cents away from 710. And this is good, because now we just need to find a way to form 90 cents using as few stamps as possible. If we want to maximize how many we do use, we want to minimize how many we don't use. And this is a little bit simpler because we can essentially use as many as we want. We're not restricted because we've already, we're working back from our maximum. So we can just use the greedy algorithm. We can fit as many 25s as we want. So the closest, largest multiple of 25 is 75 which uses three stamps. And then after we give 75 to the uh, 25 cent stamps, we have 15 left over. And again, by greedy algorithm, this is one 10 cent stamp and one five cent stamp. And this tells us we're, we're reducing from 60, which is our original, we had 20 of each type. We're reducing from 60 by three, one, and one, which gives us 60 minus 3 minus 1 minus 1 equals 55 stamps in total. Oh my gosh, that was so good. Okay, yes, thank you so much for that idea. I love it. It's nice and cute. It's very short. The less yes. math you can do, the better. Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's a wonderful way. And that takes us to question 15. Aria? I get the oh. last question. Well, you get the last one. You get the last one. I All get right. it. Elena gets it. Yes, yes. Ah, this is so exciting. Okay. So many words, though. This one walks half a mile to get to school each day. His route consists of 10 city blocks of equal length, and he takes one minute to walk each block. Today, after walking five blocks, this one discovers that he has to make a detour, walking three blocks of equal length instead of one block to reach the next corner. From the time he starts his detour, at what speed in miles per hour must Fishwam walk in order to arrive at school at his usual time? Oh wow, okay. So many words, so many numbers to work with. Uh, I guess we should get oriented with this diagram first. So we have 10 city blocks across, and in total this adds up to half a mile. So our original distance is half a mile. Do I wanna work with fractions? I think it's okay, we can work with fractions. So our original distance is half a mile and this corresponds to 10 city blocks. Now I'm interested in, I guess something we will eventually need to find out is the new distance that they're walking. So we can actually use the city blocks kind of as a metric here and count how many city blocks we're walking and then use this to find a ratio between the old distance and the new distance to find the actual distance. So let's see, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12. Okay, so now instead of 10 city blocks, we're walking 12 city blocks. 
So if 10 corresponded to 1 half, what does 12 correspond to? Uh, I guess we can do some ratio magic. We have 1 unit corresponds to 1 over 20. So then 12 units should correspond to 12 over 20. 9 plus 10 says I sense ratio of ratios indeed. So now we have a length in miles, length in miles, instead of length in blocks. And this is good because we're asked for miles per hour. We just need time. And time? Well, where is time? We had, okay, it takes one minute to walk each block. So originally he had 10 minutes to get to school. He would get to school exactly on time, walk 10 blocks, each block took one minute, so that's 10 minutes in total. So we still have 10 minutes now, because he starts walking at the same time that he does usually, and he still should get to school exactly at his usual time. So we still have 10 minutes. So we have 10 minutes to cover 12 over 20 miles. Ooh, we're also asked for miles per hour instead of miles per minute. This is, this is notable. Problems like to trick you with units, so it's a good thing that we notice the units here. Miles per hour. So maybe let's convert some stuff to hours. In particular, we have 60 minutes in an hour. So if we multiply this by 6, and we multiply this by 6, then we should get the total number of miles that you cover in one hour. So let's do this multiplication. Here we go from the distance covered in 10 minutes to the distance covered in 60 minutes. And here we go from 12 over 20 to 12 times 6 over 20. Oh, and now we have decimals, my favorite thing. I guess we have to do a little bit of arithmetic here as well. We can, we do have a 10 in the denominator, which is nice. This makes decimals a little bit simpler. We can factor out a two in the denominator. Hmm, I'm getting a number that is not actually any of the answer choices. This is interesting. Um, I, it's like he speeds up after the halfway point. He looks at the whole oh, thing what? at once. Because he doesn't find the detour. He's going the normal speed until he finds the detour. Oh, reading is hard. Okay. <laughs> I think I misread that too the first time. Ah, okay. Problem. Okay. So we have slightly less time to cover a larger distance. We can adjust for this. This is not that bad. Okay, so what this means is that we've gotten to the halfway point already. We've used five minutes, and we have five minutes after this point to cover a new distance. Instead of one quarter of a mile, which is what we would have left, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven segments. Aha, so seven twentieths of a mile in five minutes. This seems a little bit more like what you guys are putting in chat. So that seems like a good indicator that we're doing the right thing. And again, we can do the unit conversion, five minutes to an hour. So we multiply by a scale factor of 12 to give us 60 minutes. And we multiply the distance by 12 as well. 12 times the time, 12 times the distance. Seven times 12 over 20 is equal to 42 over 10, which does seem to be an answer. 4.2 corresponds to answer choice B. Yes, and that is correct. Yay. Actually, Yay. I, I, I wanted I, to say what, oh, go, all right, go on, go on. You have, oh, you have an idea. I was just, I kind of did this in a different way. Um, I guess it's sort of the same, like at the very core of it, but on the surface, it's different. And like the core of my idea was like, on the second half, he had to do like seven blocks in the same time instead of normally doing five blocks. 
So like his speed in the second half would just be like seven fifth times his normal speed. Oh, can you see? Oh no, you can't. There we go. Oh, oops. Let me just go to a blank screen. Okay. So his normal speed would be like seven fifths times his normal speed. And then we're told that he goes like uh uh how many was it? Like half a mile, and then he has 10 blocks, so it's like five miles. Wait, hold on. I'm gonna read the question real quick. Um he's going um yeah, 10 city blocks. Each one is half a mile. So usually he goes like his normal speed is gonna be um oh it's like half a mile in one minute. Okay, that's his rate. His normal speed is half a mile in one minute. So if we just convert like half a mile over one min to um like if you multiply like by 60 min over one hour, you'd get like uh Wait, 30, huh? So uh, let me just throw something in there. I'm sure that your thing will work. Uh, yeah. I also was inspired by the same idea when I looked at that. I was like, in the last of it, he has to go seven fifths times his normal speed. And then I cheated. I said, look at all these answer choices. Only one of them is a factor of seven. Only one of them is a multiple of seven. Oh, that is, okay, I see. What, what, I, what I meant is because, okay, what I meant by my multiple of seven, 4.2 is not really a multiple of seven, but it sort of is. It's just, if you make them all fractions, there's only one of them that has a seven. And then I looked at the problem to say, is there any reason why the normal speed should have a seven in the, in the denominator? And there is none. There's like no sevens in this problem. Like, you know what I mean? Like the number of minutes in an hour is like 60. There's no seven there. So the normal speed, if you just did the math, I mean, Elena did the math, you did the math, there's not a seven that's going to appear. So your answer is going to be something which is multiple of seven divided by some integer. And the important thing is the integer has no multiple of seven in it. So there's only one choice. <laughs> so it has to be B. Of course, this is not as not as comforting as what you guys were doing. But no. Hacks. Hacks. That's so rude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But very cool. I didn't okay. notice that. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. But with that, I see that people have to go. Um, we, we went over time. I hope you guys had some fun. I just wanted to emphasize, this is the way we like to go over problems. We like to see all of you. Hopefully, you guys had some fun all interacting in this chat. And we'll be back on Thursday with the, with the last 10 questions on the AMC8. And of course, if you like what we're doing on our YouTube channel, we actually have this running all the time. Oh, yeah, actually, oh, we do. We have some QR codes at the end. Maybe I'll, I'll flash it back to Elena's screen because she's the most organized here. QR codes. Yes. Great. Well, it was a pleasure to see you all. And we'd love to see you again at a future live song. Good night. Now we have to tell the people who run our tech to press the button. The magic button. The magic Thank you everyone button. for coming. Yeah, of course. It was really cool to see all of these responses in chat. I, I love when there's so much energy in chat, so many participants, all of these answers rolling in. It's so cool to see. There's been one person saying notice me in chat and it's appeared enough times that I will notice you and say hello Kevin. <laughs> Thank you for coming to our live stream. Oh, is it bad that I didn't notice him? Uh. Ah.